Hello, my name is Carlos Sanchez and I'm here to talk to you about dedicated infrastructure in a multi-tenant world. Why would you care about this? Uh, our use case was we have uh, multi-tenant Kubernetes clusters uh, where each tenant may want to have dedicated networking features like dedicated IPs, uh, dedicated uh, network connections, VPN connections, things like that. And uh, we built this uh, solution on top of Envoy. And uh, I think it's, uh, for us, it's been a great success to be able to do this while keeping multi-tenancy on the Kubernetes cluster and creating this uh, infrastructure with, with Envoy uh, kind of uh, driving it. And it's been great for us, so maybe it's, it's good for you too. So let's go. I'm a cloud engineer at the Adobe Experience Manager Cloud Service. That's the product I'm going to talk to you about today and where we build this at Adobe. And uh, my background is uh, a lot on open source uh, work over the years. I'm the author of the Jenkins Kubernetes plugin. I started uh, years ago um, and I'm a long time open source contributor at uh, open source projects like Jenkins, Maven, Puppet and so on. So brief introduction about the Adobe Experience Manager is a content management system, digital asset management, digital enrollment and forms and is used by many Fortune 100 companies. This was even before uh, the cloud service was, was created. And it was already a distributed Java OSGI application that used a lot of uh, open source components from Apache Open Foundation. And it has a huge market of, of extension developers writing code for AEM. So Adobe Experience Manager on Kubernetes we took what was already there, we started running it in Kubernetes like a couple of years ago. Um, running on Azure, we have more than 18 clusters already across multiple regions, US, Europe, uh, all over the world. And um, an interesting point is that we have, Adobe has a dedicated team that uh, runs the clusters for us and for other products. So this is uh, also limiting the amount of customizations we can do to the to the Kubernetes clusters. A very specific use case is that customers can run their own code. Um, so this uh, the customers can create their own extensions and run them on the cloud in this uh, in AM. Uh, that's why cluster permissions are very limited for security and we have to enforce like traffic uh, leaving the clusters uh, has to be encrypted. We use namespace to provide a scope on network isolation, quotas, permissions and trying to keep every tenant uh, separate from other tenants. If you want to know more about uh, these details you can watch my Kubernetes talk, uh, my KubeCon 2020 talk, and uh, where I last year when I went through more details. Today I'm just gonna focus more on the Envoy details and and this uh, networking infrastructure that we set up. So for the dedicated infrastructure part, as I said, customers want to have. Uh, their own like egress IPs because by default all the tenants running on the same on the same cluster would get the cluster egress IPs. Maybe they want to have private connections, uh, VNet peering, private link express route, all these things that the cloud provides you, the cloud provider does, or they want to connect through VPN to their on-premise or other cloud assets. So we uh, build the solution on top of Envoy. We run Envoy on virtual machines and we run Envoy on pod sidecars inside Kubernetes. And that's uh, a bit of how the whole system works. On, on the um, setup or the architecture, we have like each tenant, we give them a virtual network and a virtual machine out to scale set and load balancer. These virtual machines are running Envoy. 
the vnet can be privately connected to the customer network so if they wanted to have uh, this uh, vpn or if uh, we wanted to support uh, express route things like that we could use the cloud provided um, features and products to connect this vnet to the to the customer so the vnet where the envoy vms are running the load balancer in front of the virtual machines uh, provides the, a dedicated public reverse IP that is only for those VMs. So all the traffic going out of those VMs will have a dedicated egress IP. The private load balancer on the, on the right hand side gives the dedicated pri private egress IP for all the traffic that is going to their customer network through VPN or dedicated connections. On the Kubernetes side, we have the Java Virtual Machine configured with uh, an Envoy sidecar as an HTTP proxy. And so uh, the traffic from that JVM is going to the Envoy sidecar. Between the sidecar Envoy and the Envoy in the Virtual Machines, we have an HTTP 2 tunnel uh, that is uh, encrypted uh, and authorized with uh, MTLS. So, what are the benefits of for us of using Envoy? It is uh, for for the Java Virtual Machine. We have a simple and transparent configuration. Uh, we are using HTTP proxy system properties. So this is like Java level uh, configuration that will apply to most, or if not all. The HTTP connections that are out of the of the JVM, and we can also support uh, any other protocols not on HTTP by using different listeners on the Envoy sidecar, and all traffic from that pod into the VMs is encrypted. The virtual network on Azure allows us to configuration of VPN, private connections at cloud level as a service, so there's nothing else we have to to set up or buy infrastructure and anything like that. And MTLS prevents unauthorized connections and also one tenant connecting to another tenant envoy. So this is how we can isolate. Some of the issues we hit or, or the main issue is that uh, we have to manage one set of certificates for each tenant. Uh, for sidecars and for VMs, and that comes with like rotation, expiration, and all the things that we have to do with with uh, certificates, which becomes complex over time. How is the Envoy sidecar set up? So we have one listener with a TCP proxy filter for HTTP and HTTPS. Um, by using HTTP Connect, so using it as a HTTP proxy, that gives uh, Envoy the destination where that connection should go. For each non-HTTP port, uh, we have one listener that uh, hard codes the, the destination on the Envoy configuration under the tunneling config. And we have one cluster that uh, just points to the Envoy load balancer uh, that is in front of the Envoy VMs and uh, we have the TLS transport socket configuration there. So quickly through some code, uh, we have uh, the filter chains and uh, we are listening on port 3128 uh, where we just uh, get all the HTTP proxy traffic and we send it to the cluster, cluster zero. For non-HTTP, uh, we just put tunneling config host name, what's the destination host that we want to send every all the traffic that is coming through that port. And on the cluster side, uh, we just put the in the socket address, the destination address, uh, the envoy load balancer that is, and the port that uh, where the load balancer is listening. So those are the main uh, the main configuration options and on the TLS configuration we use uh, we point um, we point Envoy to the SDS configuration files for the certificates and the certificate authority. 
What about the Envoy VM side? How is this configured? We just have one connection manager that listens with a connect up rate. So every traffic coming in, uh, Envoy will check the connect header and then it knows where the destination is. We have one dynamic forward proxy for cluster for all the destinations. We don't have to come to hard code any destinations. So neither on the listener side or on the cluster side. So on the listener side, HTTP connection manager on port 443. And this is accepting the connections from the Envoy sidecar. And uh, we also need to configure a bit differently what HTTPS and HTTP is. And the upgrade type is connect. So all the HTTP2 connections coming in from, from one end through the tunnel, um, they get sent to the, to the right destination. And uh, yeah, upgrade type is connect. And uh, yeah, we just set the dynamic forward proxy uh, DNS setup and all that. Again, for the TLS configuration, we point and void to the SDS config files, um, both um, for the certificates and the CA. And very important, we require a client certificate. We said that requires client certificate to true. So it, uh, it is effectively MTLS. And on the cluster side, it's just the dynamic forward proxy, as I mentioned. For SDS configuration, we have a separate file because uh, this way allows us to uh, reload the certificates we have having to touch Envoy. Envoy will automatically read the, the new certificate files when there's, uh, they changed. And we set the match subject alt names. Uh, so we use the sound subject alternative names to match uh, exactly the tenant that we want to allow in those set of VMs. So the tenant that is set on this side has to match the tenant, uh, the certificate SAN that has been generated for the, for the sidecar. So both sidecar and VM envoys uh, certificates have to have the same uh, subject alternative name. For certificate rotation, we use fault agents to generate short-lived certificates, both on the sidecar and the VM. Uh, we have the certificate authority store in vault, and we have a uh, passwordless authentication from Kubernetes and Azure VMs to the to vault. So we don't have any. I mean, it's using the the APIs there. The certificates are configured, as I mentioned, in separate SDS files. And this ensures that they are automatically reload uh, unchanged. So when the Vault agent rotates the certificates, Envoy automatically notices. And the CA is the same, same setup, just two different files. There are some alternatives. You can use Cert Manager on Kubernetes side to do the rotation for the sidecars, or you could use a Spiffy. Um, that's another option. We just didn't want to complicate our first implementation, but that's something we also consider. What about Envoy debugging? This is something that is probably the most useful <laughs> advice that I can give on all the issues we hit. Um, a lot of TLS connection errors only show up on the debug logs under the connection component. And when there's a TLS connection error, the client, like the sidecar side, only sees the socket closing messages and doesn't get any feedback on why it is the connection is not is not working. So some errors that you should look for. Um, so on the config side, uh, level warning. At least this is one is level warning that you are going to get a key values mismatch if the key doesn't match the certificate. But all these other ones are only on the debug level. So alert certificate expired. OK, your certificate is no longer valid. Uh, certificate ver verify failed or certificate unknown. It means that the certificate uh, subject alternative name does not match the expected one. 
and you only get this on the debug logs. So if there's an example, if uh, the certificate sum doesn't uh, does not match, uh, this is the the log errors you're gonna get. Uh, certificate verify failed on the VM side, and this one shows on the sidecar side as uh, this one does show as uh, alert certificate unknown. How do we use all this Envoy setup? So for HTTP and HTTPS, as a normal HTTP proxy, for other ports, we just open a port in localhost in the pod. So in the sidecar, and it's available for any, any container in the pod. On Java, we just set the system properties that are the default ones uh, that any or most of the Java clients will uh, honor. So this point to localhost and the port where I'm is listening. Um, in, there's a specific case on Java that like the Apache HTTP client ignores and you have to explicitly tell them, tell the client to use the system properties. So this is something we've, we've seen. Some issues with long running connections and typical connections for database, like where you have connection pooling uh, or long and long running connections. Something we had to do is configure max stream duration and a stream idle timeout uh, because otherwise our connections were getting uh, disconnected very early. And we had also to increase the load balancer timeouts to make sure these connections didn't get dropped. But yeah, this is uh, something that you can tweak and you should if you have long running connections. The defaults don't really, uh, they, they drop the connections very early. For the connection pools, we advise customers to use um, validation of connections before use. Like in Java JDBC drivers, this is just a configuration option where you say, whenever you pick a connection from the pool, just uh, execute this query to verify that the connection is good. And some tweaks we have done, yeah, the max stream duration, stream idle timeout, these are set up uh, to increase the, to prevent the connections from being dropped. On HTTP D, you can also, um, proxy connections through these envoys. And one case we've seen is like HTTPD sends the proxy request with a connect 1.0, HTTP 1.0 header. And so that uh, we saw envoy was dropping these connections and we had to set these HTTP protocol options except HTTP 1.0 that is by default uh, disabled. So that's something that took us a, a bit to figure out. Some more resources you can find about how all this is set up. Uh, very interesting reads. Uh, the up HTTP upgrades on how these um, HTTP2 connections, tunnels work, TLS for all the MTLS setup, and the double proxy example on the sandbox. Those were very, very helpful to understand how Envoy would be configured for these use cases. So that's all from me. If you have uh, a use case like this, then I hope this helped you and show you what you could do with Envoy, what you could do to have uh, multi-tenant Kubernetes clusters and also have a dedicated infrastructure like networking. Uh, this, this VNet solution, providing a VNet for each tenant allows us to use any of the cloud providers um, products to set up a VPN, we could set up uh, dedicated IPs, we can set up an express route, the private connections, anything like that, any cluster, um, sorry, any cloud provider will allow you to do that once you have a virtual network. And then the configuration with Envoy and all this architecture with Envoy allows us to bridge the, the gap between the Kubernetes clusters 
and the virtual machines with Envoy running on this VNet. So this, uh, this is one solution that uh, we are running now and it has solved a lot of these um, use cases for us. So I hope it's, it's also useful for you and I think I can answer, uh, I want to be able to answer some questions. Thank you and have a good day.